I have the honor of giving the final presentation from the academic side. And I was brought into this program on the last minute, I would say. I was received a call on Monday where I was asked kindly, and then I would say, you know, I'm honored to receive that call, to replace my colleague Stina Håkonsen, who had fell ill and couldn't be here today. And I have no intentions of filling Stina's shoes, and I think her research is very interesting, but it's another, another topic, and she's much more interested in economic geography than I am, for example. So I, I'm an assistant professor at CBS, and I work at the strategy department. Uh, she's in the department for business and politics, so we have different focus as well. The part of my research, though, I think fits quite well into the agenda that has been talked about today. And that's namely internationalization strategies, it's R&D, it's about offshoring and outsourcing, and in particular within green industries. So part of what, or actually what I will talk about today is these two papers here um, that was published in the Journal of International Business Studies and the Global Strategy Journal. And if you're interested in these studies sort of afterwards, then please just approach me. I'll be happy to send them to you. I did these papers with my colleagues Nehal Lavate from Indian School of Business and Ramo Dambi from Temple University. And what we do in these papers is to think a little bit more about emerging market multinational corporations. And in particular, if you've seen within academia, there's been this growing interest in both the concept of emerging markets. So, you know, emerging markets are out there. They are big. They mean something for our business in general. But also in particular for emerging market multinationals, and multinationals coming out of these emerging markets. And basically what we want to do in these two papers, sort of through a case study on the anecdotal side of the research evidence which is out there, is to take an established firm from the West and then a new firm, sort of a latecomer firm from the emerging market and see how these two firms compare in terms of how they approach R&D internationalization. And what I'll show you is that while they do actually differ quite a lot then the reasons we will provide sort of suggest that they are more to the fact that they just look different or they're just catching up quite quickly. So the two firms that we are investigating, I think this company on the right doesn't need any more introduction, apart from the fact that they've been in the wind turbine industry from the very beginning. They weren't the first company in the wind turbine industry, but they've been there sort of more or less from the beginning, pioneering the design that you see here. So they were the first company to start using the three blade design. This is today the dominant design within the wind turbine industry. The company that we're comparing of two Vestas is an Indian company that are also using this three-blade design of the wind turbine. But it's a company that was founded in 1995, so from India. There was an Indian, um, there's an Indian entrepreneur who said that, you know, I have some land, I need some energy for my farming, and why not make an investment into the wind turbine? And then he deemed this opportunity and he said, well, there's actually some business in this opportunity that I can expand, I can use to generate some growth. And then all of a sudden he started making some acquisitions and today he has a company which, at least by the end of our study, was the fifth largest wind turbine manufacturer in the world. So within, in our study time frame, I think within 10 to 15 years, they managed from, to go from basically nothing to becoming one of the absolute leaders in delivering wind turbines for the global wind turbine market. And they're from an emerging market country. So India, we're saying that this is an emerging market. But I think more interestingly, they are a latecomer. So we can compare it to the incumbent, the sort of pining firm, to the latecomer, uh, as well as they come from a context in which there is not the same institutional support that you would expect from sort of national business systems that you would see in a Danish context, where the wind industry has been very dominant for sort of since the late or the mid 1970s, where you had the oil crisis and all this. So that's basically what we do with these two papers to say, well, we can see today that they are quite similar. They both serve the global wind turbine market. They are both able to deliver sort of the state of the art technologies for the wind turbine market. They're both very international. So we want to investigate a little bit more. Are they similar in terms of how they approach R&D internationalization? Before I jump a little bit into that, this is just a graph showing the trend in the industry of the wind turbine in the market. 
And you see, starting in the late, so this is in terms of how powerful, how big are the wind turbines that are being produced, state of the art. In 1990s, the industry was able to produce wind turbines that produce sort of 0.5 megawatt wind turbines. And the red line that you see here is Vestas, sort of here in the 1990s, they were at the technological forefront. Suslon only started to exist here in 1995. Um, following the trend, Vestas has been very much sort of on the lead, following and defining the market frontier. Today, or at least at the end of our study time frame, they produce wind turbines of 7 megawatt. I think today they are able to produce is it 10 or 11 megawatt wind turbines. But at least sort of in 2011, when we finish our data collection, they had the most powerful wind turbine on the market. What is interesting to see is also the case of Suslum. So they started existing here in 1995. They made an investment into wind turbine that was able to produce, I think, 0.3 megawatt. They sort of slowly start to follow the industry trend. They made some acquisitions here and there. They made some investments into R&D. And sort of slowly they start to follow up. And today, or at least at the end of the study time frame, they were able more or less to give the same type of wind turbine that the industry frontier, i.e. Vestas, was able to produce. And this in itself, we think, is very interesting, right? Because it shows a story of a company, a late entrant from the emerging market, from a context which has not the same institutional support as the Danish company, being able to catch up with the industry frontier in a relatively short period of time. And therefore, we are interested to know what is going on behind this picture. And first sort of place to start looking, of course, is the literature. And we are academics and we like the theory and all this. And if you look into the theory, it's sort of a pretty large consensus saying that, well, for firms, multinationals to be competitive, for them to be able to create knowledge, produce knowledge, disseminate knowledge, they need to engage in R&D internationalization. A Danish firm cannot just be in Denmark f in order to be competitive to compete on global markets, uh, in global markets. They need to go out, they need to search for unique talent, they need to search for unique markets, unique opportunities all around the world. And this is a pretty standard sort of, it's, this is not surprising insight that is generated from the literature. And there's been people writing about this since the 60s, since the 70s, saying that it's not just enough to be in your home ground if you want to be competitive in the global market. Looking a little bit more on the strategy side of the equation, we also, and Pilla talked about this a little bit, we know that firms um, go international sort of with two different mandates. On the one hand, you see that firms set up international subsidiaries with the purpose of exploiting existing competences. And this could be a firm setting up a subsidiary in a foreign market with the purpose of using knowledge which is already residing in the company. So we know how to make, our, make a wind turbine um, work in the market. We take it to India, we make some small modifications in India, but largely we exploit the knowledge that we have here already, and thereby we have this competence exploiting mandate. Another side of the equation would then be to say that, well, we can also set up a subsidiary in a foreign market with the purpose of creating new knowledge. So this would be a knowledge creating or competence creating mandate. And this would then be simply to say that we go to India with the purpose of creating something brand new, with the purpose of creating some new competences, not just exploiting what we have, but creating something more unique and more radical. And this, of course, requires much, of the, much more of the company. And this is sort of on a higher knowledge scale than just exploiting already what you have. And then finally, sort of looking a little bit more at how these subsidiaries work. So how do you ensure that they can fulfill the mandates that they are provided by their headquarters? We know that it's very important to have some degree of knowledge flows between the headquarters in Denmark, for example, and the subsidiary in India. And this is then crucial for the subsidiary to receive the instructions, to receive sort of the adequate knowledge that they need to catch up with whatever the headquarter wants them to do. And thereby it tells us something about how they are able, what type of obstacles may occur for them to be able to do whatever they want to do. 
And this is all sort of based on the assumption, I mean, not the assumption as such, but it's very much theorizing based on our Western ideas of how these firms are operating. Or at least empirically, we've been looking at firms from the triad regions, right? So in US, Western Europe, and all this, in terms of developing this theory that you have here. And at the same time, we've seen that you have this rise of emerging market firms. And the theory or the literature, the journals in general, have been started asking questions saying that these firms from multinational or from emerging companies, are they doing sort of the same thing as these theories predict? Are there things by these firms from emerging markets driving us to questions, the, question the assumptions underlying the insights that we get from our literature, our theory on R&D internationalization? And if so, what should we do with our theories? So that's basically then what we do with this paper, diving a little bit more into the way that they are internationalizing, the type of mandates that are being set up, and in particular the knowledge flows that flows between the subsidiaries and the uh, headquarter of the companies. If you look at the trajectory of internationalization, R&D internationalization in Vestas, you can say that up until 2000, R&D in Vestas was officially non-existing. They had an engineering department where they did all of their research and development, but any official R&D was non-existing in Vestas. Around 2003, 2004, they started to make this a little bit more official, so they set up an own sort of technology and R&D department in the company, and they started to expand internationally. So they came to the recognition that just being in Denmark is not enough for us to be able to be a market leader within this industry, which was a set goal for the company. So in 2007, actually, they set up an R&D back office in Chennai, in India, and I'll get back to this one on the next slide. 2008, they set up some energy supply R&D in Singapore. They had some aerodynamics facilities in Isle of Wight in the UK. Have electricity in Houston, US. And also in 2010, they set up some high budget engineering R&D in Beijing in China. And I think the sort of expertise or the foci of these different type of um, R&D subsidies that they have internationalized over the period that we have studied here is not surprising. So if you look at aerodynamics, for example, Isle of Wight is an island with a lot of wind, and there's a lot of expertise in how you develop blades in this location. And thereby, by going into the R&D expertise in the Isle of Wight, Vestas was able to tap into competences already present in this location. Same if you look into China. I mean, there are a lot of good, talented engineers, software engineers in India, in Chennai. So they set up an R&D back office there to access cheap but talented R&D sort of engineers that they could use in this location. And electricity in Houston, there's a huge energy cluster in Houston, and therefore they set up this expertise in Houston with the purpose of tapping into the innovation systems in these locations. And this is just a little map, so we talked about offshoring and outsourcing, which is also the purpose of, of this, this session here today. And, and I must admit that this is perhaps a little outdated, but it shows sort of the span of the internationalization of Vestas technology R&D. So of course they have the large hub here in Denmark with partnerships within Aarhus, in Olbo, uh, in Riese, out by Roskilde. Uh, they have in the UK, they have a lot of partnerships. So this is the subsidiary itself. They also have a lot of sort of outsourced partnerships with universities, with research institutions. Same goes with the subsidiary that they have in India and Chennai. So they have a very sort of established collaboration with the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras and so forth. So it just shows the expansion of the internationalization of Vestas in both emerging and developed economies. And then finally, sort of on the Vesta side, we sort of know that they set up this subsidiary in India back in 2007. And it was set up as a back office for research and development. There was a lot of patent filing, there was a lot of patent application. It's a lot of more mundane, not that complex task that was assigned to the locations here in Chennai. Very quickly though, however, uh, the management of the Danish management of this subsidiary start recognizing that, well, the people that we have here in India are actually better 
than just being allocated to deal with some type of simple patent application processing, for example. And in particular, they recognized quite soon that, well, within aeromechanical structure design, our engineers or our engine engineers have quite a lot of expertise that we can use not only in India, but that we can use globally. So they went from being sort of a back office in 2007 to, got, to get the recognition of being a center of excellence within the global Vestas R&D structure. And sort of talking to some of the people in Denmark about why did you choose India, China? Well, they're saying that part of why we're located in R&D and center in India or any, any other place in the world is that we investigate what key competencies we need and then we find out what the competencies that certain countries can offer. And sort of just to highlight that this is a dynamic process, they came with the purpose of saying that, well, good cheap engineers in India, let's go for that. But at, as they got there, they recognized that these are better than originally expected and thereby they got more and more responsibility. So they went from this competence uh, exploiting mandate to more competence creating mandate as time elapsed. If we compare this story to Suslon, and there's a quite sort of different story in which Suslon's first internationalization of their R&D was back in 1996, in which they acquired a German company with the purpose of licensing the technology to make wind turbine uh, work in India. So Sudwind was an established wind turbine firm. They had the technology necessary to produce the wind turbines. And then sort of the, um, his name, I cannot remember the name of the engineers, but at least the entrepreneur of Suslon came to the recognition that, well, if he buys the license of this German company, he would be able to start producing wind turbines in India. And this was a success. In 2000, he made the investment of a Dutch company, AE Rotor, that had uh, expertise within rotor blades, sort of an essential component of the wind turbine technology itself. Following year, they bought another Dutch company that had also sort of expertise, or at least they bought the license of a Dutch company that had expertise within rotor blades and research and development. They made further investment, the latest investment was in 2007, in which they bought an established um, German wind turbine manufacturing company that had actually a lot of expertise within the offshore wind turbine segment, so not only wind turbines on land, but out offshore. Uh, and sort of asking a little bit more about this strategy of acquiring this company in 2007 and saying that, well, they had expertise in offshore technology. They were known for the German engineering skills. And actually, after they made the, uh, the, the acquisition, there was a surprising little inference, interference from the Susan headquarters in the decision-making of the subsidiary. So what we actually saw through our interviews with Susan was that they bought this company in Germany and just took over more sort of officially. But at the floor, they were coordinating, they were making decisions by themselves, the German engineers, but instead of being called Ari Power, they were now called Suslon. So what we then saw was that while Suslon went international, they made international R&D expansion by acquiring an established German firm and thereby getting access to the technology that they had. But in terms of managing, in terms of dealing, in terms of running this company in Europe after the acquisition, the German engineers were mostly left to themselves. And this we thought, you know, was interesting as well. And in particular, if you look, you know, this was the slide that I showed you on how the industry has evolved. So we could see that, well, despite the fact that Vestas had existed for many, many years and Susan had only existed for 10, 15 years, they were still, by the end of our study time period, able to produce the same type of wind turbines. And sort of, as I started to hint a little bit, they had two different strategies of going international to get the necessary capabilities to produce these wind turbines. So something that we call output capabilities. They still ended up at the same place, showing a rapid sort of pace of catching up with the industry frontier. So therefore, what we then did is to say that, well, okay, we know that from the face of it, we can see that Suslon is as good as Vestas in dealing with whatever they can produce, so their production or their output capabilities. 
Well, we're interested in saying that, well, from the assumption that innovative firms are the ones that will survive in the long run, can we say that Suslon is as innovative as Vestas has been? And this is also a reminder that Vestas has been a pioneer in the industry. They have made a number of sort of groundbreaking innovations in terms of driving the industry forward, in terms of you know, coming up with the dominant design, in terms of making revolutions in the gear technology and so forth. So we want to know, sort of from a little bit more normative perspective, should Vestas be worried about the emerging competition coming from emerging markets? And what we then did was to get access to all patents filed by Vestas and Suslon respectively. So we downloaded all the patents and we start to look a little bit at the evolution of the sort of knowledge networks taken out of the patents that we can see and I'll sort of, it's a little complex this picture, but, but basically what we did is to take each and every patent that the two companies have got granted in our study time period. Then we look at which technology clusters the two companies are getting their knowledge from. So you cite certain knowledge clusters within your patents and thereby you can say that, well, if you're a wind turbine producer and you're making wind turbine innovation, you would typically get knowledge from sort of uh, electrical engineering, you will get technology from uh, the aviation industry for the wings, you may get some technology from software technology, and thereby we started to sort of map out from which technology areas do these two firms get their knowledge. And the results of these two sort of network analysis that we did of the technology classes that they cite in their patents is as follows. If you look at Suston, starting in 2002, they had none patents whatsoever. The first patents they started filing was in 2004. And the dots that you see here are the different technology classes. And I don't know right now which technology classes these are. But this purpose is just to show the evolution. 2006, they had a little bit more sort of knowledge classes that they cite in their patents. I think the total number of patents that they file in this period is, is around 30, 40 or something. I cannot really remember, I have the data. Uh, but we see that still, you know, although they are filing more and more patents in this other time period, it's a very shallow network. It's a very sort of narrow and shallow network in which it's not a lot of patenting going back and forth. There's not a lot of expansion into areas which are both sort of non-core as well as core to the technology which is being produced. And especially if you compare this to the case of Vestas. So Vestas started sort of filing their first patents also here in 2002. And again, to remind you that they didn't have an official R&D department before 2004, I think it was. So these were the first patents that they filed. And you can say there's, there's quite a lot of comparison between this network that we see here and the network that we see there. But what we see, though, with the network expanding over time is that it unfolds dramatically. And not only does it unfold dramatically in terms of the depth of the networks, there's a lot of citations back and forth between different uh, classes of technology that they need for their, um, that they need to, to, to acquire in terms of producing these man, uh, wind turbines. But what is also interesting is that they are citing technologies that had sort of no intuitive connection to the production of wind turbines as such. Uh, and I'm trying to think about an example right here now, um, which I cannot really do. But, but sort of the general takeaway is that they are citing substantially more technologies in their patents than the case of Suslon. Uh, and not only are they citing core technologies for the production of wind turbines, but they're also citing non-core technologies classes, which should have no sort of apparent use for the relevant technology that they are trying to develop. And from this, we are trying to say that while Suslon shows evidence of knowing what they need to know in order to produce the wind turbines that they are going to produce. And this is evident by this here, that they're citing the most relevant technology classes for them to be able to produce whatever they want to produce. But if you compare this to Vestas, they are certainly knowing what they need to know in order to produce the technology that they are going to produce. 
but they also know a heck of a lot of other things that they don't really need to know for them to be able to produce the knowledge that they need to get in order to produce the wind turbines. So we see that they know a lot of things that they have really no particular use for right here and right now. Another thing that we did also looking at the patents of these two companies is to try to see a little bit more on the flows of knowledge that goes between the headquarters, so respectively in Denmark and, uh, and in India, in, uh, right outside Mumbai, for Vestas and Suslon respectively, and the subsidiaries that they set up all around the world. And so to our surprise, or maybe not so much to our surprise, but to our sort of revealment is saying that, well, if you take the case of Vestas, so this is advanced market headquarter, they have a relatively sort of high level of knowledge, so they know a lot the knowledge that's being cited within the patents filed by the different subsidiaries around the world, draw very much on the knowledge coming from the headquarters. So we could see that the knowledge produced at the headquarters in Denmark, in Aarhus, is being sourced down to the subsidiaries which are operating around the world very much. And basically what this says is that the knowledge level of the headquarters of the Danish multinational, the advanced market multinational, is typically at the higher level in the initial phases than the subsidiaries that they set up. And this is also to show the case of Suslon or of, of, of Vestas in Chennai. So they set up the subsidiary in Chennai, you know, so assuming that they would only do R&D uh, support functions initially. So they were at a lower knowledge level. They got the knowledge from the headquarters. As time evolved, however, or elapsed, however, you would see that these subsidiaries here would start moving up here where they gain more knowledge, where they would take this knowledge creating mandate. In terms of the emerging market headquarters, so Suslon in our context, we see that, well, predominantly the headquarter is at a much lower knowledge levels than the subsidiaries that they have international. So this would be Suslon in India not really knowing how to make a wind turbine themselves going out to Europe, acquiring existing wind turbine manufacturing firms that have a lot of knowledge of how to produce these wind turbines. And thereby we see that while the knowledge flows that we saw here going from the headquarters to the subsidiaries is actually reversed in the case of the emerging markets. So the, here you see that they acquire subsidiaries with more knowledge than the headquarters and the knowledge flows therefore goes from the subsidiaries down to the headquarters. And so why do we think this is interesting? Well, we think it's interesting because it shows something about relationships between the headquarter and the subsidiaries in the two different type of firms respectively. And in particular, if you think a little bit about negotiation, about bargaining, about potential problems, we we'll say that it's relatively easier for the headquarter, Vestas, the multinational, to control the subsidiaries because they have more knowledge than the subsidiaries do. Uh, at the time sort of, of initiation. In contrast, we see with emerging market firms that their subsidiaries have much more knowledge, they know much more about how to make the wind turbines than do the headquarters. And therefore, and we have some sort of evidence of this as well, they are more likely to run into problems of negotiation. They are more likely to have this enclave sitting in Germany, for example, not really following orders about how they should produce the wind turbines. And therefore, you see that the process of catching up on sort of innovation may be more bumpy than originally expected. So what are the key findings and sort of the takeaways that I think are worthwhile to think a little about? Well, I think that it's interesting to know that these late entrant emerging market multinational firms are indeed catching up. They are making it much more difficult for firms in, say, Europe in the advanced markets to compete simply because they can sort of, they can leapfrog, leapfrog the technological evolution required for them to produce technology. They can just simply go out and buy some existing firms and thereby be able to produce the same type of technologies that the incumbent firms are able to produce. And that is what we saw here. But we also see that there's more to the picture than the eye can see in the sense that while well, the emerging market firm's knowledge base tends to be narrower, it tends to be more shallow as compared to the innovative firms from, emerge, from advanced markets. 
uh, we see that the catch-up phase, so we hear a lot about these firms really catching up quickly, occurs in terms of their output capabilities. But when we look at their ability to innovate, we are saying that this is going on much slower and much more sort of complex pace than the output capabilities. And also we see that the headquarter innovation catch-up is harder and slower as compared to the uh, headquarter catching up of the R&D subsidiary of the advanced market. So sort of summa summarum what we're seeing though is that the emerging market late entrant firms have less developed innovation capabilities and if you're building on the assumption that for you to be competitive in the global market space you need to be innovative we're basically saying that, well, the Danish firms shouldn't worry too much right now, at least, because they are more innovative. They know much more about how to make techno te the technologies. And although competition is coming from emerging markets, they should sort of not take it too grave right now. And that's sort of the, maybe not provocative, but reassuring sort of takeaway. Sort of strategic slash policy implications. Um, I believe that the incumbent firms, so firms operating in Denmark, investing in the emerging market, for example, I believe that their competitive edge rests on their ability to exploit innovation capabilities rather than output capabilities. And this is what we saw the basic differentiator between Vestos and Suslon, namely that they have a lot of knowledge that they sort of are in possession of, and this is knowledge on what you need to have in order from, for you to make the technology, but also knowledge that you don't really need to make. So basically knowing more than you make is key to continuous success for these type of companies that we are studying. And so you could turn it around as well, saying that well, for emerging market firms to be successful in the global competitive market, they need to invest in innovation capabilities. They need to go out and not only source technologies that are absolutely necessary for you to source to develop your technology, but you need to go out and sort of seek more broadly all type of different knowledge that may or may not be relevant for your production. Um, and then final point sort of relating to the specific workshop that we have here today. Of course, it's important for these firms, you know, be it Danish firms or Indian firms, uh, to access knowledge clusters all around, so outsource offshore R&D functions. Uh, but I believe, sort of, there's another research stream that I have going on right now, actually. Uh, I believe that this global or geographical dispersion of knowledge intensive activities puts immense pressure on the ability of the firm to integrate this knowledge into a series of coherent systemic whole. And it's not enough to just say that, well, let's move something to India and then we access cheap but talented engineers in India, but we also need to have sort of specified coordination mechanisms in place, ensuring that we can get access to that knowledge despite the vast geographical differences between these two locations. So on that note, I thank you very much. Mm -hmm.